Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 10 a.m. session in the Developers and Open Source Track. As a reminder to our audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org and tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag OSCC14. This hour, we are happy to introduce a terrific session called Virtual Worlds on a Web Browser. Our speaker today is Tony Alatalo. Tony is a Real Extend developer and a game programmer at PlaySign. He has been involved with Real Extend since 2007 and now acts as a development coordinator within the Real Extend Association. He is responsible for technical aspects of the University of Oulu's Olu 3D Infra project, which is building an extensive detailed model and services of the city of Olu. Welcome all, welcome Tony, and let's begin the session. Yeah, okay, so uh, hello everyone, and um, great to be here again. Um, I have to say I really uh, enjoyed uh, last year's experience and I have been um, telling about it to everybody that uh, that this way of organizing conferences actually works. Um, a couple of words. Um, um, my slides are uh, quite technical, full of text. Uh, only the last one has uh, screenshots. So uh, if you are more interested in uh, in testing the technology in in action and so forth, um, I'll just type the um, address in the in the local chat. Um, that's one way um, how you can uh, test this technology in uh, in this um, MeshMoon uh, hosting service um, and the web. Web client there is called a uh, WebRocket, and that's the um, that's the real extent based uh, technology that I'm talking about. Um, so um, my my topic to um, um, today is uh, is totally to focus on this um, capabilities of uh, web browsers and and how virtual worlds um, run on top of them. And this is something we have been actually working on for for many years. Um, I could say a few words um, about real extent as a background. Um, last year, my my talk here was um, only about that, about the relationship um, of um, um, real extent and an open simulator. So I'm I'm not going to repeat all that here now. But in the keynotes, um, it was really, and also the previous talk here um, by Vitaly, it has been really interesting to hear this uh, interest in um, in customizable um, viewers, um, because that's exactly what we did um, starting um, 2008 or so. Um, we first made this uh, Nali viewer from the scratch. Um, as an OpenSIM client, with the idea that the um, that the user interface and the whole user experience is um, totally uh, like defined by the application or the or the scene, um, and that's what we have continued, and and that's how we are doing business actually. Um, so um, it is it has been really uh, really critical for us to be able to. Um, sort of exactly to define the user experience um, in the applications for the customers um, often really simple uh, uh, applications and sometimes with avatar and sometimes without um, now we have some uh, kind of map based uh, environments kind of like a two and a half d experience and and so forth so um, so we are kind of happy happy there and happy with the technology that we have with real extender we can deliver to customers but the only thing that kind of 
makes me sad is that we haven't been really able to serve the uh, the OpenSIM community um, basically because we are not compatible with the um, with the existing content in in these worlds. We don't have uh, prims, and also we don't have the same kind of um, creation tools. But um, but I think that's something that. Uh, I think we can. I, I'll be thinking during the conference, and we will discuss um, with the uh, with the other developers here that perhaps we can find ways to collaborate in the future. But here the focus is just uh, like generic uh, web browser stuff, and and not about uh, real extent. That was uh, last year. So here we go. Um, what virtual worlds mean to me is that this is really like a collection of uh, all technologies that to create, um, for example, like this um, experience that we have here at the conference. We need interactive uh, 3D graphics. We also want uh, 3D special audio, but um, but uh, we also want. Um, real-time networking with um, with UDP or TCP sockets and uh, and we also want uh, speech and um, so that we can talk um, so it's really like a collection of basic kind in a way like all technologies that uh, that computers can um, can handle so so when second life started I checked that it it was kind of in in 2001, and um, and then when when we begin began the the real extent work um, based on that um, in 2007, um, it was kind of simple in the sense that there was no choice. Um, web browsers couldn't do any of that, so so it was obvious that um, that you had to have a a client, uh, a native application um, that people have to install, like a game or so, and and that's it. Um, there was no big dilemma because that was the only uh, only choice. Um, but since then, since then, since 2009, nine or so, um, mostly Google, but also other browser developers. Have been really pushing the um, the browser stack. Um, we'll see that um, details about that later. But um, but okay, first this basic question that that why why would somebody be interested in the web? Um, and yeah, um, because well, we already have these uh, native clients like the what we are using here for the conference. So why why do we care about the web? So it really uh, for us is sim simply this um, this basic point that easy access for the masses, because um, we try to do normal business like a, kind of like a, any web shop. So so it's really like a no-brainer that when we talk with our customers that who perhaps want some uh, 3D world that that okay it has to be easy for anybody to uh, to access and, and so there's no way that that they would use anything that requires installing a custom software and preferably not even um, even plugins like Unity but um, but they really just want something that works. Um, Works easily for the masses, and on the desktop and uh, and with laptops. Um, that basically means uh, websites. So so this really is about uh, providing something for the masses. So if you have a case where you're dealing with a limited uh, group of um, people, um, professionals for doing uh, some work or or your friends or whatever. If you're dealing with people who can install uh, um, um, a, a special uh, virtual worlds client, then you don't necessarily need the web for for anything. Um, but also, I want to point out 
that will be sort of the last point in my talk that um, that that's still not the whole story because um, even for expert users and um, the web technology is interesting because it's really flexible and um, as in um, very uh, freely programmable so so I think that um, that's an interesting aspect of it for for everybody um, so so about the actual uh, technologies I hope this uh, slide is um, visible enough it's a little bit smaller text so in the first earlier I mentioned that okay we, we need all this technology we need graphics we need audio we need real-time networking and we want to have voice chat uh, so what has happened in the in the recent years is that the um, um, well basically Google and Apple and and, uh, and Mozilla have been um, developing all these new new technologies uh, under this this uh, HTML5 umbrella um, so so we basically basically have all this now for graphics there's GL which means um, that you can use uh, OpenGL ES uh, from um, um, from JavaScript and and the status of that that is pretty good it has been there for long in uh, in desktop uh, Chrome and, and Firefox um, Safari also supports it, but um, doesn't work as well yet. And and Microsoft, um, as you perhaps know, um, Microsoft was uh, opposing the whole idea uh, early on, but um, but since then they have um, jumped aboard. And actually, uh, during last summer, like in June, July, and and I guess all the time now, they have been improving the. Um, WebGL support in um, in Internet Explorer 11 especially, and um, it's actually pretty good. So for audio, um, I actually don't know that too well myself yet. Um, it's actually in our to-do list to to add um, 3D audio to um, to our browser client. But my understanding is that with the Web Audio uh, API. It basically works okay. Then for network synchronization, um, we have had web sockets for a couple of years now um, as kind of the frozen standard. And I think it's um, well supported in, in all browsers. So, um, so we are kind of fine there. And then, then for voice and actually also for video, uh, chat. Um, this is the newest um, technology now. This uh, Web RTC for real-time communications, which is actually uh, UDP-based, um, which is really what you want for for something like an audio stream or video stream. Um, so that's like unreliable networking where you don't get extra latency, um, unlike with TCP. So that's more recent. So for long, uh, WebRTC was um, was only in in Chrome, but um, but nowadays it is in uh, in Firefox as well. But uh, I haven't actually even tested. So um, so I don't know what the uh, what the status of WebRTC in in Firefox is. But um, but in Chrome, it has been working great for us. Um, actually. In that Mesh Moon hosting service uh, for for real extent worlds, um, you can have um, voice and video chat uh, as well in the uh, in the browser client. And um, and again, if anybody has questions or anything, uh, just shoot. Uh, we can discuss it at any point. Mm, okay. So always when we are talking about uh, WebGL and 3D graphics and uh, especially uh, OpenSIM worlds, uh, there's the question of um, performance. And um, yeah, I would say that it's not uh, it's not 
too great. Um, um, although it's very impressive. Um, I mean, if you read, um, for, for example, uh, 3JS, um, the rendering code, um, there is still quite a lot uh, that the um, um, that the JavaScript code has to do for every frame, um, like hundreds of lines of code um, that the browser runs in JavaScript uh, to push uh, the new data to the um, um, to the graphics card every frame. So, um, so yeah, simple scenes on my uh, two-year-old laptop with uh, with just this uh, Intel uh, graphics card. Um, they do reach uh, 60 frames per second, which is to me quite impressive with, considering the amount of um, JavaScript that is uh, executed for every frame. And um, that's possibly pos possible, uh, of course, um, because of the just-in-time uh, compiling uh, the JITs, uh, GITs that they have in the uh, in the process, but typically when we have a more complex scene, um, at least my laptop goes down to uh, to 20 or 30 frames per second. But um, but that's still like okay, it's still usable, and um, and it's actually similar to what I get with uh, usually with this uh, with the second life viewer as well. Um, but uh, but the content is usually simpler. So so how does this work out? Um, if thinking of OpenSim content and just naively putting huge OpenSim scenes there, I think it uh, would just die. But the way we are able to do business uh, in our company and with our partners is that we simply make uh, light enough scenes. Um, so, um, so of course, there's ways to optimize, but also in many applications, you don't need millions of millions of polygons, but but you can just make the designs so that uh, so that they are not heavy, because we don't really have an option. Uh, um, the web browsers are the only way that we can we can use in our business. So, so we kind of adapt to that and um, and then create the content um, accordingly. Um, okay, but a note um, about complex scenes, um, like if we were to render, for example, something like this conference venue or, or more complex uh, uh, open sim scenes, um, I think if, if you would, I don't know, like convert all that to Colada and just push it to the um, to 3JS, for example, it would go down to I don't know, one or two frames per second, I guess. Um, but that, that that does not mean um, that it would be totally impossible to um, to render complex scenes, but you would have to um, to make a nice system for that. Um, for example, um, I read this one article some years ago how the how the IBM folks made a unity based uh, open sim viewer and they were using this very clever idea that you had kind of layers that for the nearby objects um, they were kind of like one layer or one scene and and that was updating with um, good frames per second and then then there was like three or four different zones that the more far away objects and especially small objects um, uh, were rendered with uh, less frames per second. So, um, so this this way you could have a like really a complex scene, uh, and still it would be like running fine uh, when you control it. Um, and this kind of stuff might be actually quite simple to do. I'm actually tempted to to try it <laughs> because uh, with uh, with the three JS library that we use. It's actually really simple to have many scenes, and 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 it's just JavaScript to uh, uh, to control the rendering. So you can actually uh, uh, 
render multiple scenes to to compose the final image. Um, so um, so we haven't done anything with this yet, but um, we might actually try it. Uh, it might, might work. Um, and then for for complex scenes and and especially for like um, poor devices like mobile phones and tablets, um, but also in general for sort of easy access for people to just see a scene, it's also possible to switch to um, to server side rendering, which means that that you're actually running the 3D on the server side. Uh, on some beefy computer with uh, with graphics hardware, and then you just send uh, either video stream or or, or even just uh, still images to uh, to the um, to the client. Oh yeah, and as Justin notes in the um, in the in the chat, uh, also Second Life has been doing this. Um, yeah, and as Oren said, Oren notes. Um, uh, dealing with uh, LODs like level of detail um, for the meshes and, and sort of perhaps a parts of the scene and so forth uh, can also work. So um, so there are ways to deal with this complexity, but um, at least we have not done such such work yet. Um, okay. So. A note about the uh, mobile devices. So, um, so in a way, WebGL already works on mobiles. Um, Android Chrome uh, got it enabled by default, I think, in April. And now, with the uh, iOS 8 update that came uh, like a month ago, uh, also iPhones and iPads uh, run uh, WebGL by default. Um, but it's it's kind of slow, so uh, you can go uh, through the examples and well, some of most of them are like few frames per second, and and only very simple ones run uh, like 50 frames per second and so. So uh, so that means that you can still do simple things and and again dealing with this um, level of details and so forth. Um, I'm sure that it's possible to do nice um, mobile applications also for the um, with WebGL, but actually our conclusion about this was also that um, that within real extent we still also continue work with uh, with native uh, rendering um, uh, in C++. So. Um, our current uh, this sort of mature um, client uh, Tundra, which is actually the same code that we use as the server as well, um, that uses the uh, Ogre uh, 3D engine, which we have been using since the beginning, basically. Um, but actually now this um, mobile uh, client, um, we are now doing with a new uh, 3D engine called uh, Urho 3D, um, which is actually developed by uh, by Lasse Erni, who is the guy who uh, who has done the uh, the Ogre uh, work for for us. Um, Ogre is kind of old and slow, um, so Urho is like a modern 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 um, faster renderer. Um, so that's how um, how the guys are now implementing um, also this kind of really simple, lightweight, uh, small install um, client targeting um, Android tablets basically first. But but um, so that's that's going on right now, and uh, it's it's quite interesting for us because the old Tundra client is kind of big. Well, also like the second life view with uh, Qt and so forth, but with this we are gonna get a small native client, um, more similar to the to the Unity player, but uh, but open source. So so my point here is twofold: that okay, we can already use WebGL on mobiles to do simple stuff, 
but um, but JavaScript is kind of slow there, so so we are gonna use uh, the simple C plus plus client uh, on mobiles as well. Um, okay. Yeah, I see the. Uh, uh, there's comments about mscripten in the uh, in the chat so this is my uh, my slide about that as well so um, so my view is that both um, a JavaScript code and native code have their uses so um, um, JavaScript is a good way to deploy to the masses uh, on on desktop PCs and laptops, but uh, but native is, um, you easily need that uh, with mobile devices. And so now we have, um, um, so if you do that, then then you end up having, a, like we currently have a two um, different uh, code bases for the different clients. So, so you get this kind of like duplicate work um so there is this one one um, possibility to uh, to solve that problem and to only have one uh, unified code base and that's um, um, using C++ to develop the code and then use uh, the mscript and uh, compiler to um, to compile that to JavaScript to run in the browsers and we actually made a plan um, with that idea already in, in 2012, when uh, mscripten was kind of started to seem like a proven thing, but it would have been quite a lot of work for us to um, to create um, a new client from scratch, um, because the old Tundra with Qt and Ogre, that wouldn't really work. Uh, you cannot compile Qt with, uh, with mscripten and expect it to, uh, to work in a browser. And, and also be, because we got funding uh, for the web client uh, from EU, and that was uh, specifically to, to focus on the web stuff. So, so it was simpler for us to use this existing uh, 3.js um, WebGL renderer, and then just um, add the networking and, and the other stuff we need on top in this um, Web Tundra project. But, um, but in the meantime, um, the uh, Unreal, people at Epic and the, the Unity folks, um, they have actually followed this plan. So um, so the WebGL exports uh, that you can do from, um, from Unity are um, compiled with mscript. And, and actually now that we are also making this um, kind of small minimal uh, client using the Udho 3D engine, uh, our plan is also to try uh, compiling that with mscript and to uh, to get an, the same uh, uh, client code to the uh, to the web as well. But um, I think we will get to that in uh, I don't know in two three months when uh, when the code for that client is uh, is sort of when it has the, enough of the basics so that it makes sense. Um, so, um, so that's interesting, but but I'm also a little bit cautious of this um, of the mscripten way, because how how mscripten works is that okay, uh, you develop uh, your application in C++ and or you use uh, Unity as you do normally, and and then okay you compile and you get this kind of big blob that you can then just put to the web. Um, so one one problem there, I think, is that that the um, that compared to uh, to, a, to a small minimal handwritten uh, 3JS uh, JavaScript application, the downloads uh, for these kind of big compiled engines can be larger, and and then. Um, a bigger point for me is that um, that okay, if you just make a game like you usually make with Unity or, or Unreal, um, you are like in a box and and you don't care uh, and it's fine. You just want your 
game to work work on the web. But for me, actually, um, because we uh, we don't only work with games, but we we work work with education and and um, and communications and um, all kinds of these kind of information systems. Um, it's really nice with this uh, Web Tundra 3JS way that uh, that we can use all the other web stuff as well. So we can use all the existing uh, web uh, UI libraries and and if somebody is using uh, like a content management system, um, we can just call those functions as well. Um, so um, so you can do something like uh, like if you click an, an, an object in the uh, uh, in in world, you can actually have that call some function which is actually provided by some other JavaScript library uh, to like to publish a blog post or whatever. And I'm afraid that there's no way to do that. If you're developing in Unity, you cannot call uh, other web libraries from your Unity uh, C sharp code. So um, so that's um, kind of a downside as far as I know of this um, M script and uh, C++ compiling way. So, um, but perhaps there is some nice solution for that, but uh, at least in the future, but I just don't want us to throw the baby with the um, bathwater uh, with this otherwise nice idea of having a single code base because, well, I like many web things, so. Um, uh, okay, um, well, I could comment also, Alan uh, is asking on the chat whether we have had a chance to look at the virtual world framework. Um, yes, actually, I was uh, really interested when I, when I noticed that. Uh, I think that's the one f from the, uh, like, connected to the US um, military. Uh, perhaps the same people who were here last year talking about the Moses project. And um, and in, in this um, VWF, um, they um, they have also written a um, a browser-based um, client from uh, from scratch, and uh, seems like that with nice ideas. Um, I don't know it too well, but uh, but I have I have had a look a couple of times, and we should um, um, check uh, check those. Um, yeah, I could co um, comment on the other questions now as well. Um, thanks, Galen. So, um, this is different. So, okay, so there's a question that why is this different from web, web meetings and Google Hangout stuff today for the audio? Uh, it's actually not different. <laughs> so, so web RTC, uh, which was this technology for for uh, video and audio chat has actually been pushed a lot by by Google because um, um, they want to, because I think currently still, or at least a while ago, uh, Google Hangout uh, requires a plugin, the Google Talk plugin. So, um, and, and Google doesn't like, like plugins, so, uh, so um, that's why they have been pushing this web RTC standard to have uh, the audio and video codex and the and the UDP networking in the process. So so we are really piggybacking that um, uh, and just basically doing the same that Google is doing, but but just uh, integrated to uh, to three D worlds because uh, that's something that they don't have in in the Hangouts yet. Um, Okay, then there's another question about building and, and inventory. So we actually have an editor, uh, like a simple uh, scene editor made uh, so that it works in the browser. And also the 3.js itself has an editor as well. And if you want to have an inventory, then uh, basically you can develop that using the normal uh, web, web technologies. Um, but we don't really have like a reusable inventory system as an open source, so um, because our, our applications usually don't need that. 
Um, about standards, there's a question that what kind of standard should we develop? Um, well, I'm personally interested actually in the networking. So I think it would be interesting if we had like a standard protocol for virtual world networking. And, and we have proposed our entity component attribute system for that. So um, because in the process we already have um, like the low level standards, but but um, but it, for virtual worlds it might be interesting to have this kind of higher level standards for, for virtual world applications. Also a big topic is the um, is the content formats. Like many in the game business are using FBX, which is really a pain because it's a closed and secret fo format. So we have been testing this uh, GLTF format, which is like a, an optimized format um, for Collada files. So that's um, so like asset standards is something that would be good to have. And there's also a question about Babylon JS, which is a nice uh, kind of like a 3D JavaScript game engine from from Microsoft. Um, yeah, it looks nice, but 3JS is more popular and kind of small and simple. So we have been sticking to 3JS. And what's actually interesting is that that Microsoft itself uh, also has been using 3JS recently because the Photosynth um, 2 uses um, uses uh, 3JS as well. Um, okay. Um, Yeah. Okay, I think I return to questions soon, but I show my final point quickly so I don't lose that um, altogether. So, so this is the one one point that I want to make. That, that okay, a big point point about the web is that this ease of access. That okay, we can deliver stuff to the masses. But I think the um, for me a big point is also that the web is. Uh, I think unique in uh, in how programmable it is. Um, like really, like the browser is an, is an empty canvas, and then then when you when you go to a website, um, you download code and and it can do anything and and provide you any kind of user experience. And and I really love that. And 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 I don't think that really exists in anything anything else. And how they have made it secure and so forth. Um, and of course, there's like so many many libraries that you can mix and match and so forth. So, so how I see that what it means to the uh, to the virtual worlds is that that it, when we are running virtual worlds in a web browser and when we are using uh, JavaScript JavaScript libraries like 3JS to do it, uh, we have all this liberty uh, when creating the virtual world scenes. So. Um, so you can, you could even customize the rendering for your scene or, or whatever in the uh, in the user experience, um, and you can uh, use uh, custom shaders uh, for your objects or whatever. So I think that's um, uh, that's for me really interesting because because I wish that we would get uh, really rich uh, different kinds, many kinds of beautiful artistic and also customized to use and all kinds of virtual worlds so so I think the uh, the web platform has um, has great great potential for that and else and this I mentioned also earlier that that uh, we're thinking of education or something where you have this um, like Moodle and or something and or, or, or blogging or whatever where you have uh, content management systems um, the ability to to have both the virtual world code and then all this other web code in the same uh, uh, like as a part of the same application in the same JavaScript engine where you can just call functions from uh, like um, yeah any function from anywhere. So um, that's that's really interesting for for me. So so that's what I'm a bit afraid that. That we might miss if we only stuck to the uh, to this M script and or Unity way, um, and that's it. That was my my stuff. Uh, there's some s screenshots of our things, but I I check questions now now again.
Mm. Um, okay, so um, Oren was asking about uh, web viewers. Um, so, and yeah, uh, you cannot just use UDP. So, so basically, yeah, what we are using is web sockets with TCP. So, so yeah, if you would um, want to do that, would need to add um, um, like a web socket server um, support to the um, to the Open Simulator, and I think Nebadon uh, did that already to some extent. So, um, so there's the question whether it would be difficult to adopt the uh, the real extend API for that, and I think that. Um, it would be actually really simple to uh, to implement the um, the Tundra protocol uh, in Open Simulator because it's really simple. Uh, we are using this entity component model, and and the network protocol uh, reflects that. So we only have like like six messages or something like that that create entity, delete entity, create component, delete component, and modify attribute, and then some like a login message. So so it's a really simple protocol and really simple model. Um, but you can actually use it to to synchronize any data. So for example, to, to add um, prim support, um, you just um, would add um, prim components to the uh, to the uh, client side code and and then you would make the uh, open um, web socket um, code to um, to sort of put the prim uh, to the uh, to the prim component, but you wouldn't actually need any uh, any new network messages uh, when you added prim support because uh, the generic uh, component attribute synchronization would uh, uh, give the uh, the client the prim data. So so I think this way it would be possible to. Um, to map all the open sim data prims and avatars and whatever you, you want parcels and so forth um, by just using this generic protocol um, yeah. Mm. yeah Austin has a question that sounds a bit philosophical to me is it better to try and push the web into a viewer or viewer into the web um, I think it can be interesting to do it both ways. That that we can push um, um, like a viewer to the web, so that anybody who just visits a web page can see and participate in a world. But um, but also like in uh, in Krista's effort, and also what we saw in the previous session here, to make the native viewers uh, customizable. Uh, it can be interesting to actually support um, uh, like having custom web views um, with HTML and JavaScript in uh, in the native viewers, so that uh, so that uh, also with these powerful uh, C++ applications, the uh, the user interface can be uh, or the user experience can be customized the same way. Um, so so I think we can go <laughs> both ways. Okay, I check if there's some other questions, but uh, I don't think you have much much time though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or Oren there is uh, talking about the Google Google and uh, and loading and so forth and that's something I would like to know that uh, Google has been now uh, integrating Google Earth to uh, to Google Maps uh, using WebGL and uh, and it's pretty cool like it's quite fast and and they they deal nicely with the uh, level of detail so uh, um, so that's also like a cool demo of how uh, how you can uh, Render big worlds with uh, with WebGL. So um, because earlier Google Earth required installing a, a C++ written plugin or or a, the separate Google Earth application, but but now thanks to WebGL they are sort of integrating it to the uh, to the maps. 
okay, I misunderstood Oren's point, but but anyway, um, anyway, that's um, that's what Google is is doing. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know if I, ha if I have a much of a wrap up. Uh, I can say that um, that I'm happy that we have a working technology stack with the real extension stuff, so so we can use the Tundra server and we can use the Web Tundra, Tundra client to uh, to uh, to create virtual worlds and and make applications. But as I said, um, it might be interesting to um, to try adding um, support to OpenSim as well. Perhaps with the same protocol, or or just doing a an open chill, a web chill viewer. Otherwise, um, yeah. Um, if anybody if anybody's interested in working there, we are certainly certainly interested in participating and and uh, and we are also funded to do this work. Uh, we have a two year continuation for the EU funding that we have used for for one year now. Okay, Tony, um, so, yeah. I think yeah. I think we're going to have to wrap up the session, but thank you so very much. Um, as a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Following this session at 11 a.m., we have a break in the schedule for lunch or dinner, wherever you may be in the physical world. We also encourage you to visit the Story Wheel exhibit in the Education 2 region to view a tool created in the 16th century called the Books Wheel, which can be thought of as a precursor of the modern website. In addition, if you are a crowdfunder at the exclusive access level or above, you are invited to a VIP Q&A session with today's keynote speakers in the Staff Zone Auditorium at 11 a.m. Finally, we'll return after the lunch break in the keynote regions for an exciting keynote address from Philip Rosedale, Rosedale of High Fidelity, who will attempt to answer the question, what is the metaverse? Thank you again to our speaker and to you, the audience. We'll be back after lunch. Have a terrific break. <laughs>